Welcome everybody back to the Friar Talk podcast and YouTube channel. So for today's episode, Ryan is going to be going over his full offseason plan for the Padres. Um, it's a long one. So Ryan, let's go. Let's hear what you got. Um, he's going to go through it once and then we're going to kind of comment on some of the things we think about and, and we'll go back to him to go over that kind of stuff. But any questions that you guys have for Ryan as well, comment them. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure I can I can send them to you or you can check them out, Ryan. So, you know, you can get back on them if there's any specifics that need to be like kind of discussed later on. Because I know it's a lot of moves um, and in baseball, like it, nothing's super simple. You know, there might be some moves that people think are unpredictable or whatever that is. But let's hear what you got. All right, ladies and gentlemen, I am back. The Kathy Bates hair is gone. As promised, I finally got a haircut and I am ready to present the off-season plan that I have been working on since August. I This has gone through so many different phases. I've asked so many different people, like their opinions on signings and trades and stuff like that, um, and worked as hard as I can to formulate what I feel like is the best possible off-season for the Padres to go after. I just want to say before I get into it, I'm going to be reading off of my phone a lot because I have a lot of notes. I have stats on there that I want to read off. So, you know, if I'm not making direct eye contact, I apologize. I know that's kind of a bad look, but, you know, I got to do what I got to do to present this. So let's get into it. I got a lot of things I want to talk about. And we're opening the notes. All right. So I was looking at this Padres team going into the offseason. And I was trying to pinpoint our biggest deficiency. What's the biggest thing that the statistics are showing is holding us back? And I looked at everything, ERA, FIP, batting average, on-base percentage, you know, a whole bunch of stuff, surface-level stats, advanced stats, and one really stood out to me. And that was we were 20th in Major League Baseball in slugging percentage. Slugging percentage isn't exactly an advanced stat. It's one of it's one of like you know the key stats you see on every slash line for every hitter slugging percentage. You know that's a that's a big deal, especially in today's day and age where people have recognized that power hitting is slowly starting to take over from contact hitting. People are starting to recognize that power hitting is a little more valuable, and the Padres being twentieth in the entire league below other teams that didn't make the playoffs and had worse records than us, that's pretty telling of what I personally feel is the main problem, is we had a very, very severe lack of power in the lineup. You had Tatis, you had Machado, who are the two big power hitters. Cronenworth hit 21 home runs, which was you know pretty solid, but it's not that much. And then from there, you know, you had Myers, who hit 17, and, you know, a whole bunch of guys that just didn't hit for power. And... So my focus going into this plan was I wanted to add power to the lineup. I wanted to make a deep lineup filled with guys who at any moment could put points on the board. That's that's my my overall goal here. Now, the other thing I wanted to do was I wanted to avoid making trades. In the past few off seasons and trade deadlines, we've been really trade heavy. We trade away a lot of prospect capital. And if we want to sustain success for years to come, we can't just continue trading that prospect capital until it's gone. Then you're going to end up like, you know, the Chicago Cubs. I'll use them as an example. They ran out of prospect capital. Good players stopped coming up from that organization. Eventually, everyone else at the major league level fell off and they imploded on themselves. You can't do that. You got to have a strong prospect base going along with a strong team at the top. So I wanted to focus on signing free agents this offseason. This is arguably the deepest free agent market ever. So, I mean, it, it goes hand in hand. You got to focus on free agents this offseason. Peter Seidler has been talking a lot about spending money. You know, he took over from Ron Fowler basically because Ron Fowler didn't want to commit the amount of money to put the product on the field that we're seeing now. And Peter Seidler is 100% committed to winning. So the budget I gave myself was the current luxury tax threshold at 210 million. That could change because we know the collective bargaining agreement is up in December 1st and they've been talking about lowering that to 180. They've been talking about implementing a salary floor. We have no idea what's going to happen. So I just decided to completely ignore all of that stuff and just stick with the rules that we know that we have right now, because otherwise it's just complete and pure speculation. A salary floor would be awesome because then we could probably get out of 
the entire Eric Cosmer contract, the entire Will Myers contract. You could trade pro far. Someone will just take that money. I mean, it would be awesome. It would, it would be the greatest thing to ever have to happen to the San Diego Padres. Um, another thing I wanted to, to talk about to kind of back up my claim that the budget can go up to 210 million. And we've kind of seen this with them bringing in Bob Melvin and all that stuff. There's a glass ceiling on the San Diego sports market. We are the big, probably the biggest sports market in the entire country that's never won a championship. And there's so many jaded fans that just will not watch the Padres because they say, oh, it's the Padres. They're not going to be good. They're going to trade off all their good players, and they're just going to continue to suck because that's what happened until since the, the 60s. And Peter Seidler is the first owner in a long time that's been like, no, we're going to keep winning. And the reason he's doing that is he knows that he needs to break that glass ceiling. He needs to bring a championship to San Diego. And then his investment of buying the Padres is finally going to truly pay off. Because then you're going to enter a threshold that you've never entered before where people actually believe that a San Diego sports team can win a championship. And you'll enter a whole new level of profits. So that's what I think Peter Seidler's uh, motivations would be here to take the payroll where I'm taking it. So with all that squared away, let's finally get into it. I did some calculations on my own to uh, figure out the payroll I'm going to start with. And the number I got was $192.9 million being committed to next year. That includes some moves that have already been made. I didn't account for those yet. So... I'm just going to kind of read them off as if they didn't happen, and we're going to get into it right now. First move we're going to make is designating for assignment Eric Hosmer. He's gone. We'll eat the whole contract, $20 million next year. I think it's $13 million the three years after that. It's We just have to get him off the roster for reasons that we already know, for reasons that I know that I can't say. He's got to go. The only, I, I talked to someone that I trust a lot and, you know, has a pretty good understanding of how, uh, you know, trades and stuff work. I wanted to make a trade with like mid-level prospects to get rid of some of his contract. They said that's not going to happen. In order to trade Eric Cosmer, they told me that it has to be a, con, uh, a prospect that is pretty much guaranteed to succeed in the major league level, like Robert Hassler, CJ Abrams. So, you know, you either have to trade them with Hosmer or DFA him and get rid of him. I don't want to give up any more prospect capital. If I'm Peter Seidler in this situation, I'm stepping up and I'm saying, we know we need to get this guy off our team. I'll I'll take it in the pocketbook and, you know, it's done. DFA him, let him go. We've already talked about this. You know, we'll, we're paying the whole contract. He's gone. My next moves are a few non-tenders to get a little bit of uh, salary off the books. Some of them already happened. Uh, the names are Keone Kella, Sean Anderson, James Norwood, Jose Castillo. There's some pretty decent relievers in, in that uh, in that group right there. But whether it be injuries or ineffectiveness, they didn't fit on my 40-man roster. So I just decided to non-tender them all. They're not coming back. That's going to take our payroll from $192.9 million to $190.2 million. Next thing I'm going to do has already happened. I'm going to decline the options on Mark Melanson and Jake Marisnik. Mark Melanson, I don't feel like he was that great as, as a closer, even if the surface level number said he was. And I would just like to act like Jake Marisnik doesn't even exist. So we're not going to take those options. That's $9 million combined right there already. So that's going to bring us down from 190.2 to 181.2. And here we go. This is going to be the most controversial move on here, in my opinion. This is the Will Myers trade. Somewhere in the United States of America, wherever Chase is, he's not here right now, he heard me say Will Myers trade and his ears perked up. And he said, something's not right. Because I'm about to talk about trading his pride and joy, Will Myers. Now, Will Myers does have some value, you know, especially if you move him from left field to right field. I'm going to switch over to my uh, my stats real quick. Just take a second. Yeah. If you move him over from left field to right, from right field to left field, he immediately becomes a lot more valuable. In his career, he has negative 17 defensive runs saved in right field as opposed to plus five defensive run saves in left field. So 
you can really ask yourselves, why was Will Myers playing right field this year? I have no idea. He was clearly much better in his entire career in left field. So this year in 2021, Will Myers hit 256 with a 334 on base, 434 slugging, a 768 OPS. That's pretty decent. 17 home runs, eight stolen bases, 0.8 uh, war from baseball reference, 4.1 war from fan graphs in 442 at bats. He's going to go to the Miami Marlins in this trade. They're publicly looking for outfield help. And Will Myers is an outfielder. There's a deep free agent market for outfielders. I don't think Miami's going to be able to sign to because there's a lot of people going after free agents. Now, that alone, you know, Will Myers alone isn't enough to get Miami or any team to take him for one year, 20 million. And I'm trying to get his entire 20 million off the books. So we're going to take advantage of a market deficiency. The catching market this year is horrible. The top two catching options in free agency are Jan Gomes and Manny Pena. I'm pretty sure 75% of you don't even know who Manny Pena is. He sounds like someone that would be randomly generated in MLB The Show. Uh, and he is the second best catching option on the market. So actually, even better, the third best catching option is Sandy Leone, and he's the guy the Marlins are trying to upgrade from. So what we're going to do is we're going to throw in a guy that I was already trying to get rid of, Victor Caratini. I don't think we need to keep Caratini. I don't buy into the idea that you Darvish needs to throw to him. You Darvish has been pitching for like what? 15, 20 years from in here and Japan. He's worked with a bunch of different catchers. He's a professional. He doesn't need to work with Victor Caratini. It, it, I just don't buy that. He's a uh, last year. He hit 227, 309 on base. 323 slugging, 632 OPS, seven home runs, nine doubles, zero war from uh, baseball reference, negative 0.7 war from fan graphs. Uh, he did not have a great year last year, but he's all right in terms of catchers. There's some bad catchers out there. You think Victor Caratini's bad? Look at Jeff Mathis. Oh, my goodness. Um, so... Victor Caratini is going to go over there. We're basically going to give him to them for free. He's got a couple years of cheap control. He can work well with their pit young pitching staff, you know, and, and they don't have to worry about competing with other people in the free agent market or getting a big name like Wilson Contreras that's going to cost a bunch of prospects. And from there, this trade, I'm going to leave it a, a little open-ended, a little ambiguous, because my goal is just to get rid of that Myers $20 million and – throw Caratini in there as well to get him off the roster, give Miami a catcher. As for our return and the prospect that we're throwing in, I'm going to leave that open-ended because I don't quite know what it's going to take, you know, to, to make that deal work as long as they take the 20 million from Myers. The three names I'm going to include as options in terms of prospects, Ethan Elliott, Yuri Angelis, and Brandon Valenzuela. Those are three solid prospects. They're probably 45, 50 future value if you know the, the prospect grading system. Uh, one of those three should be enough to get this done. I don't expect really anything in return, so I'm just going to leave that blank. Maybe we get a, a player to be named later. But that trade right there is going to take $22 million off the books. I think they'd accept it to you know get a catcher, get a prospect out of it, maybe see if they can you – know, get that Will Myers from 2020 back. And that's going to take our payroll all the way down from 181.2 million to 159.2 million. So now we, now we got a lot of space to work with. So next trade is going to be the Adam Frazier trade. Uh, Adam Frazier is coming off best year of his career. Great defensive second baseman, great contact hitter. But if I want to imp improve the power on this team, Adam Frazier is swinging a wet noodle out there. Adam Frazier went to someone's backyard, got a pool noodle, brought it to Petco Park, tried to swing from the left-hand side of the plate, and grouted it out to second base a bunch of times. Um, but he just had a, a three-and-a-half, four-war season, so you can't really discount that. Um, and if you look at that Blue Jays lineup, I'm trading him to the Blue Jays. I don't know if I said that. But um, if you look at the Blue Jays lineup – they are just right-handed power hitter after right-handed power hitter. Vlad Guerrero, George Springer, Teoscar Hernandez, uh, Lourdes Gurriel. They don't really have a lot of left-handed hitters. They don't really have a lot of contact hitters. They could go for one. 
and he just so happens to be a great defensive second baseman. So I see them being very interested in Adam Frazier, not only for his skill set, but because he's on a very cheap deal, projected to make $7.5 million in his last year of arbitration. Toronto's main focus going into this offseason is going to be resigning big starting pitchers like Robbie Ray, Steven Matz. Maybe they bring in a bigger name. Who knows? But they're going to focus on that rotation and spending big money there to support that lineup. And I can see them easily jumping on an opportunity to get a cheap second baseman. So financially, they can allocate their resources towards starting pitching. I'm also going to throw in in that trade, Emilio Pagan and Trey Wiegenter. I'm trying to get both those guys off of my 40-man roster with the crunch. Emilio Pagan had a drinking game invented after him last year. You have to be pretty bad to achieve that level. Uh, Trey Wingenter, he's had some injuries. He's got great stuff, but you know he just didn't really fit. The thing with the Blue Jays, if you look at the recent history, they don't go after the top guys on the reliever market. They go after lower guys they don't really have to pay as much for, and they try to get the most out of them. Uh, most recently, they went after Kirby Yates. I think they went after Brad Hand after he had a really bad season in uh, in Washington. You know, they, they like those guys that they can flip, not pay a lot of money, and try to get the most out of. Pagan and Wingenter both have that kind of uh, skill set where they feel like they can turn them around. Um, in return, I'm going to be asking for two prospects, and it's going to be Kevin Smith and Samad Taylor. Uh, Kevin Smith is the number nine prospect in Toronto's system, Samad Taylor is number 17. Let me read off some numbers for you guys because this is uh, important as to why I want them. So Kevin Smith in AAA last year, he hit 285, 370 on base, 561 slugging. That's a 931 OPS, 21 home runs, 27 doubles, 18 stolen bases, and 355 at-bats. Samad Taylor in AA. He hit 249, sorry, 294, 385 on base, 503 slugging, 888 OPS, 16 home runs, 17 doubles, 30 stolen bases, 320 at bats. Kevin Smith is an infielder. Samad Taylor is a second baseman slash outfielder, kind of that Mookie Betts type. And these are both guys that at the upper levels of the minor leagues, they absolutely raked last year. They were good at everything. They stole bases. They hit for power, hit for average, got on base. You know, everything that you could ask for in a player. And if you look at recent history, guys like Randy Rosarena, Jake Cronenworth, Adolis Garcia, guys that rake at these upper levels in the minor leagues, they're the ones that are breaking out nowadays. It's not necessarily the top prospects that are breaking out on a consistent basis like that. It's these guys who are having success at the like really high success at the other levels, upper levels of the, the minor leagues. So I wanted to bring these two guys in for depth. They're breakout candidates. They could potentially you know, be the next Jake Cronenworth that suddenly becomes a, a core piece for us. And I think Toronto accepts that trade because they're getting a lot of value in return. All right, let's move on to the next one. Oh, and before I forget, that's going to take our payroll down from 159.2 million to 148.5 million. All right. So now I've got to stop making transactions real quick. And we're going to talk about a contract extension because I'm actually going to use this in order to save money for next year. This is the Joe Musgrove contract extension. This is his last year of arbitration. He's a free agent after this season. He wants to stay here. We want him to stay here. He's a very sustainable uh, type of, you know, type of pitcher that, you know, he's heavy on curveballs not really dependent on velocity. So, you know, he could be good for years to come and I want to keep him in San Diego. So we're going to pay him six years, somewhere between 80 and a hundred million dollars. Now this is going to be a heavy backloaded deal. I know that didn't really work out with Will Myers, but I feel like this is different because we're currently in a con uh, contention window and we're pushing it back to, you know, whatever the future may hold in 2026, 2027. But the main focus here that I was trying to do was I'm going to buy out his last year of arbitration. He's projected to make 8.8 .8 million and I'm going to take that down to five. He's just going to make $5 million next year. If you're paying him $80 million, he's going to make 
10 million in 2023 and 24, 15 million in 2025, and 20 million in 2026, 2027. You can really configure that out whichever way you want. My main goal here was just to get that $5 million uh, contract for next year. That's going to bring 3.8 million off the books. And Joe Musgrove would be a Padre until 2027. You can backload that contract however you want. It's just getting him here for that long and getting 3.8 million off the books for next year. That's going to take the payroll down to 144.7 million. All right. So if you sat through me through that, I was 20 minutes of me blabbering and cutting down payroll. Now we can start having fun. All of that was to lay the groundwork for actual additions this offseason. And that's going to start with this trade where cutting payroll and adding payroll is going to overlap. So this trade is actually one you guys also came up with independently of me. Before I even knew you guys had a Josh Bell video, I came up with this trade too. So if we all came up with the same trade, I think it's pretty likely to say that it's fair. So this trade is going to see Eggy Rosario, our number 15 prospect, Matt Strom and Javi Guerra, they're going to go to the Washington Nationals for their first baseman, Josh Bell. So Eggy Rosario is an infielder. He's short, really stocky. Uh, he flashed six tools at, at double A. Let me bring up his numbers real quick. Yeah, so at double A, he hit 281 with a 360 on base, 445 slugging, 815 OPS. He had 12 home runs and had 30 stolen bases in 420 at bats. At 21 years old, to be able to do that in double A, that's pretty impressive. So, uh, yeah, uh, I can see the Nationals being very, very interested in him. And they also, you know, don't have a very strong bullpen. So, giving them Matt Strom not only takes 2 million off of our books, but that gives them someone to maybe flip at the next deadline and Javi Guerra as well. You know, you need to free up 40 men roster spots. So I'm going to throw them in Josh Bell. He's a great switch hitter, 800 OPS from both sides of the plate. Um, really good to put in the middle of that lineup. So you don't have to worry about them using a lefty specialist on you in a, in a certain part of the lineup. Cause he can hit well from both sides of the plate. All right, I'm going to try to go a little bit faster right now. So we got that move done. That's going – trading Matt Strom is going to take our payroll down to 142.2, and then getting Josh Bell is going to bring it up to 151.2. Next trade I'm going to make, Augustine Ruiz, uh, our number 27 prospect. He's going to go to Texas for Brett Martin. Brett Martin is a, a lefty specialist type of reliever uh lefties hit with a, a 66 ops plus against them last year at times we only had tim hill in our bullpen as our only lefty option so i wanted to bring in another good lefty he's got a great slider i talked to a guy named reporting from the diamond uh he works uh to report on the the rangers organization he told me that this trade would absolutely be accepted uh this is the type of guy that uh the rangers love to bring in really toolsy a lot of power uh always everything's kind of raw so we're not giving up a whole lot and brett martin would be a really good uh lefty option coming out of the bullpen um now i'm going to start adding a couple more relievers i wanted to touch really quick on the fact that other than pierce johnson there's not really a whole lot of back end guys in our bullpen that i trust a whole lot so i wanted to kind of focus on bringing in some cheaper options that could potentially impact the back end of our bullpen the first guy I'm going to sign is Thiago Vieira. He pitched in Japan this year. He had a pretty okay season, uh, but his stuff is what really sets him apart from everyone else. His fastball sits at about 100 to 103 miles per hour. That's pretty insane. He just set a Japanese baseball record, hardest pitch ever thrown. He's got a nice mid-80s slider that has vertical break, high strikeouts, also high walks. Um, got uh, Relievers coming over from Japan don't normally – make that much so i gave him a two-year four million dollar contract two million a year he comes in 
you know, we can worry about the walks later. His stuff's going to play in Major League Baseball. He throws 103. So that's a, a nice option to have at the back end. Uh, with the Martin move and with this move, payroll's going to come up to 153.5 million. Next signing is also going to be a reliever from Japan that throws 100, Robert Suarez. He's played in Japan pretty much his entire career. Um, he had a phenomenal year last year, an ERA almost close to under one. Um, not the best strikeout numbers, but for a guy that throws 100 miles per hour consistently, he barely walks anybody. He had eight walks total last season. And I mean, he is just incredibly effective. You know, I don't think I can really think of too many guys that have his level of velocity and command combined. Uh, he's got a nice change up type splitter pitch that uh, he throws as a secondary. Couldn't find much info on that. But I decided to give him the same deal Pierce Johnson got two years, $5 million. Just lay that out evenly, um, 2.5 a year. And that's going to bring the payroll up to $156 million. Now we're getting into my favorite signing this offseason, the biggest steal, Luis Garcia. A lot of people don't even know who this guy is. They probably think of the guy from uh, Houston that pitched in the World Series. This, is a, this guy pitched, I think, in the seventh inning for the Cardinals this year, and he's just ridiculous. Someone in the scouting department noticed that he was a lot more effective when he throws his sinker over his four-seamer. They switched over to that, and this year – he was just ridiculous. The sinker sits about 96 to 100. He's got a mid 80s slider that is just unbelievable. It might be even better than Joe Musgrove's. And everything improved hits per nine, walks per nine, uh, strikeouts per nine. Um, he's another guy that, for someone that throws 100 miles per hour, especially with movement, he, he has a legitimate sinker that moves. He doesn't walk a whole lot of people. He had 2.5 walks per nine. That's really good. I think he's good enough, even though he slept on to come in and take over the closer spot. Most people don't even have him in their top 15 right-handed relievers list. I think he's one of the best relief options on the market. I think we can steal him two years, $8 million, $4 million a year. That's going to bring the payroll up to 160 And we got the rotation, sorry, the bullpen covered. Next, we're going to do the rotation. I expect one of Mike Clevenger or Chris Paddock to be injured the start this season. Uh, other than that, we should be fine. Um, but instead of going out and getting a, a pricey big name starter, I want to get a guy who everyone gets on a cheap contract every single off season. He goes into their team and he completely outperforms expectations. That's Rich Hill. Rich Hill played in Tampa and New York last year. Uh, he had 158 innings pitched. He started 31 games in none of those starts. He gave up more than four runs. And most of those he went, was able to go six innings pitched. Last year, I think he got like one year, $1 million from the Rays. I'm going to give him one year, $3 million. There's nothing indicating that he just can't still go. He's got great curveball. That still plays. He's not dependent on velocity. And, you know, I, I'd love to have him as our fourth or fifth starter. Next, just a quick depth move. I'm going to sign Luke Miley. He's a, he's a catcher. You know, he didn't really play much at the major league level. He hit throw over 300, but that was in 30 at bats. He's just a depth piece after we get rid of Caratini in case one of Nola or Camposano gets hurt. He can sit in AAA, come up, be the backup catcher. Um, so that's going to take the payroll all the way up to 163.5, that combined with the Rich Hill signing. Uh, next, we're going to go sign another bench player. It's going to be Brad Hand. Sorry, not Brad Hand, Brad Miller. Not Brad Hand. He, we don't want him to go up there and try to hit. Um, we're going to sign him one year, $3 million. He plays every position, none of them particularly well, but he does play them. Um, versus right-handed pitching last year in 844 OPS. Uh, gives you a lot of power and walks off the bench against right-handed pitching. Um, he does strike out a lot, but, you know, oh well. Um Last year, coming off of a better season, he got, I think, one year, $4 million. So I'm just giving him one year, $3 million. I think that's fair. Um, not, I'm not expecting a whole lot of competition there. That's going to take payroll up to $166.5 million. Now we're getting into the fun signings. Thank God. We got all the depth moves out of the way. Let's fill out that lineup with some big hitters. 
First things first, we're going to sign Nelson Cruz to a one-year, $12 million contract. We should be getting the DH next year. And if we're getting the DH, we're getting Nelson Cruz. A.J. Preller's tried to get him multiple times in the past two seasons. I saw he wanted to play him at second base, apparently. I don't know what the hell he was smoking when he thought of that. But he's going to he's going to DH for us. He's not going to play the field. He's not going to even look at the field. Uh, he's a respected veteran, great leader. Um, his peripherals look great. I know a lot of people think he's slowing down, but he's still hitting the ball very, very hard, just as he was in the past few years. The man doesn't age. Uh, I expect him to, to come here and just break as he usually does. 30 home runs hit 250, 270 uh, you know, behind Machado and Tatis. That's going to bring our payroll up to 178.5 million. Next, we're going to go sign a right fielder. It's going to be Avisael Garcia. Now, one of the reasons I'm really drawn to this guy is he did not get a qualifying offer, despite how good he is. And, um, you know, he really just fits really well. Uh, if you look at his stat cast numbers, just like Nelson Cruz, hits the ball really hard. It kind of shows that his power is not going to go away anytime soon. He can come in, hit 25, 30 home runs here. Good contact hitter. Always hit for a pretty decent average. He's got good power coming off 29 home run season. Um, in right field, eight defensive runs saved. He's the 80th percentile in sprint speed. You know, he's really well-rounded. A lot of people don't think about that. Even if he strikes out a lot, doesn't draw a lot of walks, everything else looks really good. Um, MLB trade rumors had his contract being at three years, $36 million. Totally fine with taking that $12 million a year for a guy who's going to be a three war right fielder, you know, good on good for me. Uh, that's going to bring our payroll up to 190.5 million. And finally we get to make one last big move. We got a little bit of space between 190 and 210 and we are going to sign Kyle Schwarber. He's going to play left field for us. So yeah, get ready for that. However, even as atrocious as he probably is in the outfield, he had an insane season. He had a had a 9.28 OPS, hit for tons of power, draws tons tons of walks. You know, he hit 260, which you know I he normally doesn't bring his average up that high. But even when he doesn't hit for a high average, the walks and the power, he normally has an OPS of 820 or higher, which is pretty impressive. Um, I'm giving him three years, $48 million a year. That's $16 million a year. We're making up for that little bit you know, of a low ball offer, the $20 million mutual option for the fourth year. Um, after 2022, he can slide into the DH spot after Nelson Cruz leaves, and you don't have to worry about his defense anymore. He gives you tons of power from the left side of the plate, which we were severely lacking. He just fits right in the middle right there in between all those right-handed power hitters you have. And he really rounds out that lineup. So finally, we end with a payroll at $206.5 million. I left a little bit of wiggle room there just in case you need to add anybody, just in case I made any you know, mathematical errors. I wanted to make sure there's a little bit of a gap between my final payroll and $210 million. Um, there's going to be a few guys that you can even cut off of the roster before the season starts um, to save a little bit more money. But here's what we're looking at in terms of a lineup in 2022. Jake Cronenworth leading off at second base. Fernando Tatis Jr. batting second, playing short. Kyle Schwarber batting third, playing left field. Manny Machado batting fourth, playing third base. Nelson Cruz batting fifth as a designated hitter. Josh Bell playing first base, batting sixth. Avisto Garcia batting seventh, playing right field. Luis Campusano playing catcher. I'm going to have him as the majority catcher. I think he's ready to come up and just unload on the league. He's going to bat eighth. And batting ninth, Trent Grisham in center field. There's not a guy in that lineup that cannot hit at least 15 home runs. I think, what, six of those guys probably hit 30 or more next year. You know that that's just ridiculous. That there's, I don't think there's any team in the league that would have that amount of power depth in their lineup. We'd be putting up tons of runs on the board, and if our starting pitching under Ruben Niebla even comes close to what they're capable of, this is going to be one hell of a team. 2023, CJ Abrams comes up, plays second base. Uh, you can sign a left-handed outfielder. Kyle Schwarber moves to DH. You still got a pretty strong team. Yeah, Ryan, I love it. And we talk about it a lot. Um, 
I don't have a ton of time here, so I'll keep my part short and I'll let Isaac finish up real quick. I love the moves though. I think, you know, the big moves in terms of Schwarber, Josh Bell, um, I like the Rich Hill signing a lot just because that is a guy I don't think they need to go and get some massive starter. I think a lot of people feel like that because the pitching underperformed. But we got to remember where Clevenger's coming back. Um, you have a lot of young starters that are about to be like called up or kind of in that period of like they might go into the bullpen, not really sure. I think a guy like Rich Hill where he can just be reliable is is a great addition. But talked a lot about Josh Bell in the past. A lot of these guys, I do think Schwarber's a good one. Would definitely be a big signing. Um but I think that's one that it definitely makes sense. Um, and in terms of the lineup, I love the lineup. Oh, also Nelson Cruz. Always, always love Nelson Cruz. But Isaac, what are your thoughts on it? Yeah, so mentioning the starting pitching, uh, really other than Joe Musgrove, there's a lot of question marks surrounding uh, Mike Clevenger's health, <clears throat> Chris Paddock's health, uh, if Blake Snell's going to be able to keep it up, and I guess you Darvish also. Um, so while I don't really think we need a big-time starting pitcher, I – think I would expect AJ Peller to go after one um, just because he's always the guy that wants to hit the home run that people refer to him as the madman. Um, AJ Castleville mentioned it in his inbox. So, you know, I, I'm, I'm with you guys. I don't think we need one, but I would expect him to go after one. Um, Rich Hill is a great option for a, a nice depth piece. Um, uh, you know, the rest though, it's really good. There's a lot of guys that, you know, I know it's not exactly the flashiest moves, but at the same time, you don't need the flashy moves. The, the Braves won the World Series with making zero flashy moves at the deadline. Just guys that can produce at a, at a you know, at a high level on a cheap contract. And that's kind of what this Padres team needs right now. They, they can't really afford to keep buying high on players like Adam Frazier. Um, so, you know, really solid. I like it. I think it rounds out the lineup. I've mentioned before the need for power is huge. That's why I'm kind of, in, you know, I've been in favor of getting Frazier out of this lineup because power is shown to, to take is showing that it's taking over the league right now. So, uh, you know, I like it. I saw Garcia. Um, I think he had 29 bombs. Nelson Cruz always hits nukes. Um, so Josh Bell, obviously his, uh, you know, his savant page looked fantastic. So a lot of power being added to the lineup. I like it. Yeah. Love it, Ryan. Anything else you want to add real quick before we take off? All right. I think, I think I'm good. I uh, I said everything I wanted to say. Just let me know what you guys think. If you have any questions, I'd love to do a follow up video. A lot of information, so I know that you know I probably didn't cover everything to answer everyone's questions. So I'm open to, to answering your questions on Twitter or on here or anything you guys want. Yeah, definitely. And I will comment the entire plan um, in the. I will pin that as a comment so it's easier. Like if you need to like follow and pause and stop and check these guys out. Um, because that's definitely going to be a case. A lot of the stuff you're bringing up, Ryan, is like, oh, look at this guy, you know, look at his savant page and stuff like that. You can easily do that and kind of go through the offseason plan that way. But thanks again for coming on, Ryan. Super fun time. Um, I really like the offseason plan. I think it would put the Padres in a fantastic spot, both right now and also moving forward, does not deplete the farm. And while it may be pretty expensive for Peter Seidler, if, if he wants to take over that market like you talked about, because I totally agree with that, this is the way to do it. You can make this a not just a a like like a pod, it would just become a Padre city. Like there's no other team to compete. And we've seen like I mean, you guys see all the memes on Twitter of the wild card parade. Like imagine if that's if that starts becoming the regular of winning a lot. I know you didn't see the last year, but they can definitely put themselves in the position to do that. Already done that with Bob Melvin. Love this plan though. So thanks again. And we will talk to you guys soon. And Ryan will have you on definitely soon. Um, and maybe we'll go over some of these questions and stuff, um, but super fun time. So appreciate you coming on.